Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for June 2nd, 2020. I am Joe Lynch. It is my pleasure to welcome back to Somerville Media Center Live the City Council President Matt McLaughlin and his newest colleague, Councilor at Large Kristen Strezzo. Good afternoon to both of you. Kristen, we're going to start with you. How are you doing on this June 2nd? Thank you for asking. Um, I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, my family is doing well. No new news to report with that. And we're definitely happy that the weather is a lot warmer now. So getting the children out on socially distanced walks is easier when the weather cooperates. Great. Kristen, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions. And I know that City Council President will allow me to do this. You are the newest member of Somerville City Council and you were in the last election you came in fifth out of the four um for vying for one of the four city at large uh, councilor at large seats and uh, stephanie hirsch um had left uh the city she moved out of the city and you assumed your seat i i want to say in may is that correct and i think Councilor Strezzo is frozen. Are you are you there? Am I frozen? I'm here. There you go. So you assumed your seat sometime in May. Is that early, correct? Early May, yes. Great. And how's it been so far? This is a baptism by fire for you. <laughs> yes, definitely. I'm in I'm enjoying every minute of serving my beloved community. And uh, so I'm absolutely honored for this. This is a very difficult time uh, to come in but my hope is that it only makes me a stronger and even more devoted counselor to serve Somerville. Well, I would say after being a political observer all these years, you have a good group of colleagues and I'm sure they're gonna help you walking through that maze called local municipal government. But here is the guy who leads the pack at City Hall, uh, Councillor Matt McLaughlin. Matt, you have, a city, you have a public health, public safety update for us on June 2nd. Yep, just an update for the community, Joe. Uh, we do meet every Monday, uh, public health and safety. A lot of the information I'm going to provide can be found on the city of Somerville's website at somervillema.gov and look for the coronavirus link. Uh, as of today, uh, there's been 902 positive cases of COVID-19 in Somerville. 665 people have recovered and sadly we've had 27 fatalities. Uh, the city announced that city offices are going to remain closed past June 1st, uh, so they have not set a deadline for opening, but they're only going to open the buildings when they believe that uh, they can handle the people coming there. So uh, city buildings will be closed uh, for the time being. Uh, and the city has started it rolling out its um, reopening plan for businesses in the community. Uh, which is about a week behind uh, this Massachusetts standard. So we're trying to hold ourselves to a higher standard and make sure that uh, we prevent the infections as much as possible. Uh, establishments have started opening since June 1st on the condition that they submit compl <clears throat> excuse me, compliance safety plans to the city and follow all safety requirements in the state's reopening plans. Um, so we've also, June 1st, barbershops and hair salons have been open. So those of you who have hair, uh, you should be happy to know that uh, you can get your hair cut or get your hair done. Uh, there'll be a limit on blow drying, uh, among other restrictions for uh, hair salons, uh, appointments, things like this. Uh, so they're try trying really hard to make it as safe as possible, but also uh, return to normal. Uh, and the city has also announced a $2 million uh, in CARE Act funds. Uh, for COVID-19 relief, and they've announced that almost a million and a half of those dollars they want to use for rent stabilization to help people through these tough times. Uh, a lot of people have been out of work, and the federal government's uh, funds are only going to go so far. So the city is de dedicating about a million dollars, a million and a half, to help stabilize tenants, which will also help landlords because they can collect their rent as well. Uh, if people are interested in that, if you need help with rent assistance during these times, you can call the city's number at 617-625-6600, extension 2581. Uh, so I would highly encourage anybody watching who has tr who's having trouble making rent to uh, call this number. I'll say it one more time, 617-625-6600, extension 2581. 
Uh, so that's all the updates I have for the week, Joe, but I'm happy to uh, take any questions from you. Thank you, Matt. I think uh, a little later in the conversation, we're going to get into the uh, rollout by the city for businesses reopening. Um, I let you both know before we get on the show, I just got off um, another town hall session with the mayor, um, George Proakis, and his economic development team. Uh, yesterday, the governor issued the directives for the phase two reopening, primarily focusing on restaurants and small businesses for curbside or outside dining and um, drinking. So I wanna get into that a little later, but what I wanted to do was give um, Councilor Strezzo a little opportunity here to talk about some of the committee assignments that she's gotten and where a lot of her focus will be um, over the next um, coming year or so. Kristen, why don't you take it away and just kind of lay out for folks where you are at this point. Well, uh, well uh, this week I, I will have my, actually, so Wednesday will be my, I will be chairing my, my first meeting as the chair of housing and community development. And I have also been assigned to uh, gender equity and vulnerable population commission committee. Uh, the community cabinet committee, which has to do with educating education and making sure that uh, families and, and children are getting it, It's a partnership with Harvard University and, uh, to make sure that uh, families are, are getting the, the most equitable uh, Most equitable experience out of our school system and Somerville was uh, lucky to be chosen for the project um, and so with the um, Housing and Community Development Committee tomorrow, uh, we, we will be talking about, um, well, continuing on the conversation. One of the things on the agenda is uh, the talking about, I don't have the agenda in front of me, but talking about stabilization uh, of our most vulnerable uh, populations, those of us trying to, in our community, trying to stay in our city with rent, but also I, I wanted to get an update, uh, put a, a see if, if we have an update with uh, the uh, Little Sisters of the Poor uh, property. And I'm hoping that we, we can have an update and find out what, what the status of that is, especially in this time. Those are, are some, it will be a virtual meeting, which will be interesting. It'll be my first meeting being chaired, chairing, but also uh, virtually, which is so. I'm, I'm curious to see how it's going to go as well, but I, I'm up to task and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Well, so far so good. Your, your internet connection is great. <laughs> your, your, your lighting is great. Um, as opposed to city council <laughs> president McLaughlin, who sometimes <laughs> we have to reposition because of the lighting and, you know, but this is all new to, I, I know to many, many people. Um, and, and you know, some people are enjoying it because uh, like me, I can sit here and flip flops and fool, fool the public that I'm in front of the Somerville Media Center building um, and still have time to, <clears throat> still have time to enjoy, you know, what I can enjoy at home. But housing and community development, um, that is one critical, um, it's a critical committee on the uh, city council. And I, I won't say more so than ever, but it is such a heightened awareness now that we have of people who are housing insecure. Um, they've lost their jobs. They don't know how long it's gonna be before they'll be able to go back to work. We have landlords worried about paying mortgage. Um, they'll be understanding for only so long. Um, and then maybe, you know, once we get towards the end of the summer and into the fall, if things change, um, we are going to have a critical, uh, a critical need for affordable housing in this city. Not that we don't already, but um, you know, I fear that with the loss of income, that need is gonna increase exponentially going forward. So I'm some of the, I, know, I know some of the things that you've been working on is the affordable housing issues that come along with your assignment, committee assignments. Um, what have we got in terms of stabilization that's still available to the public. Do we know that number, the amount of money that we still have? 
with the affordable housing land trust yes. and, and i'm also on on that trust fund uh, i sit on that that board as well um each it, it depends i don't have the numbers in front of me but each each um like where the the money goes with the uh we have some housing coalition we have uh, uh cast and we have um uh, just to start who are receiving funds from the trust fund and in the meeting uh, the, in the meeting that uh, I sat in my first meeting with the affordable housing trust fund Cass had said we're out of money money that was supposed to carry us until 2021 is 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 accounted is is already committed to helping our community and now Cass has has the option to request more money and ask for more money from the trust fund but it's that was in April, April of, of, of this year. That was supposed to last another year. Now, when and and I went into a description of this in in the city council meeting last week. So sorry, Matt, to repeat myself, uh, Mr. President. But uh, when when a family, a household, is is deciding that they need help, is, is is figuring how do we how do we get help. For rent, maybe we should explore our options. When they've already received gotten to that point, they may call the Office of Housing Stability. And I, I went into this at the city council meeting, just describing how the process goes for a lot of families here in the city and community members. Um, when they get to the point that they need to make a call, they may call the Office of Housing Stability. The Office of Housing Stability is slammed right now, and they reported that they had a backlog of 150 to 180 cases that they still had to respond to they still had to respond to those so so then from there they may get assigned to okay we'll give Cass a call or you sound like you may be a viable um, candidate for this program or that program so they're just waiting to get to Cass, waiting to get to just to start um, everybody's just giving all they have right now giving all they got so the cares fund does help and but the need right now is so extreme and we are in may no we're in june so we don't know how long this is going to last we really have to do all we can to help our community members well i think you know between uh, uh, between all of your colleagues i think you're going to get the support you need um in the committee that you're trying to run there matt let's shift it back over to you um let's talk about you know, people are worried about their housing, and the, I think the major reason they're worried about their housing is because they may not have income. And what we're trying to do now, based on the governor's guidelines that were issued yesterday, is to bring b businesses back in a safe and, and orderly way, um, as opposed to the abrupt way that they had to stop business. We're trying to bring them back in the middle of a pandemic. Why don't you, uh, if you want to walk through a little bit on what you know about how the city is going to be moving forward, reinstituting some safe plans for businesses to come back online. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the city started uh, uh, re uh, reintroducing businesses to the community, and June 1st was kind of a big deadline uh, or to begin. So things like hair salons, which are kind of one of the uh, more people centric businesses. So we started with businesses that it's easy to keep social distancing from. And now we're moving to the ones that are a little more difficult and holding higher standards. A lot of these standards revolve around basic signage, informing people of what they have to do to maintain social distancing, uh, washing their hands, both employees and uh, customers. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, restaurants, uh, trying to maintain higher standards there. So I know. Uh, some people are concerned about the high standards we have, but we also have high standards for things like dealing with rodents and cockroaches as well. So now we have to deal with um, a pandemic. So it, it's going to be slow unrolling, but it is with the balance of trying to get people back to normal, but also accepting that there is a new normal. And I think these standards are going to remain even past this because we'll be dealing with another disease someday so it's good to get this in right now and learn learn from this experience to prevent something like this from happening again in the future so there are phased uh rollouts that you can definitely find very detailed information on the city of somerville's website somervillema.gov and they go into all the details for businesses to explain uh, what they have to do in order to be compliant 
Yeah, I'm not, uh, thank you, Matt. I'm not gonna get into detail because I think some people know I also play another role here in the city, which is chair of the Somerville Licensing Commission. And we've been heavily involved with the two state agencies that we have to deal with, uh, which is the ABCC, the Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission, and the Cannabis Control Commission, not so much for them because we don't have any retail sites open, but from a restaurant and liquor license standpoint, I just got off, just prior to this show, I got off the town hall that the mayor and um, the city staff were conducting for the restaurants in this city. The guidelines were issued yesterday. The guidelines will be in place until at least November 1st. So what they're trying to do is provide relief to the restaurant industry and the service industry to allow them to expand their footprints. So as you know, in service, in restaurant service, will come at a much later phase when the go governor deems it uh, safe enough to have people go back into the interior of restaurants. Right now, we're getting relief by the good weather is here. Some people have outdoor seating, some people don't. Um, what we're trying to do, and the licensing commission is part of that, is to streamline the effort and the paperwork and the process and the procedures that you have to go through in order to get outdoor seating. So the licensing commission, the one thing I can tell you is the licensing commission has made a commitment to the city because you know we don't really report. Um, we report to two different ways. We report to the mayor and we report to the city council. So we have kind of a dual structure. What we've made the commitment is that we will, we will have as many meetings of the licensing commission as the city needs us to have in order to process these new applications to allow for the expansion of these restaurants. Um, of course, we don't do that in a vacuum. We do that in consult with the city side, meaning the mayor and his staff, the city council side, President McLaughlin and his colleagues. We do that in conjunction with the fire department, the police department, ISD, health department, all these different agencies of the city have to work very, very quickly in order to allow the restaurants to reopen first and foremost safely and secondary within the guidelines that have been issued by the state. So that rollout, um, based on what the mayor said less than an hour ago, that rollout, they are trying to have some kind of a document ready by this Thursday. Um, in order to submit to all of the different agencies that are out there. And I assume, I'm making an assumption here, Matt, that it's also coming to the city council. So the city council and each of the city councilors and the all at the at-large councilors can understand what it means for their respective wards. Um, not all restaurants are gonna be able to participate in this, primarily because of their size. You know, if they only have five seats indoor in their restaurant, and they're gonna be allowed to expand based on a certain formula, it may not be worth it for them to come out onto the sidewalks or into the streets. So that's what I took away from that meeting about the rollout. Um, I know that there were well over 100 participants on that call today. Some bigger restaurants, some smaller restaurants, mostly smaller restaurants, trying to figure out what exactly could they do. Matt, I know this is gonna come you know, to, you also have a committee called Licenses and Permits. Um, and I know some of this will come to your, your, um, your committee. And I think what they're looking for is an expedited process. Is there, is there any consideration of the council meeting more frequently than you do already? You meet twice a month. Well, I'd say we meet twice a month for regular city council meetings, but we meet basically daily for committee meetings. So Monday through Thursday, we're always meeting and we have always expedited outdoor seating permits. Usually there's not much of a discussion and they just get approved at that meeting. I think there'll probably be a little more questions this time uh, to see, um, you know, if they're compliant. But I do think we will be able to handle outdoor seating licenses. Absolutely. And I'm a big fan of outdoor seating in general before all this happened. So 
Uh, if we can address two problems at the same time, make, make things more accessible to businesses and have some outdoor seating, I think the council will get behind that. So I don't think we need special meetings to approve outdoor seating. We will be able to do that within the time frame we have. I think you've just made a lot of restaurants very happy by saying that. So um, let's see where it goes forward. Next, next up on the agenda I is- do, I do, I wouldn't mind uh, chiming in on that as absolutely. well. Um, yeah. I, I think that we have to do everything we can to support our small businesses right now that, that don't have huge uh, corporate backing or that, that are, are just doing everything they can to just thrive in this moment. Um, and I am curious, uh, for me, I, I wouldn't mind putting in a little extra time. I'm new to the council, but at the same time, uh, if we do have to go to another meeting, I know um, maybe extra time, but I think it's worth as well examining just to make sure that, that we can um, support small businesses. And if that does require rolling up our sleeves and sitting in another meeting and going to another meeting to do that, I'm committed to that as well. You can always tell the newbie on the crew, Matt, when they say they're willing to go to more meetings, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, I'd say, I mean, we're going to meet as much as necessary. And we're going to yes. the bucket season, which is going to take up a lot of time as well. Right. I just don't think that, well, I don't think we'll need the extra time. Because I think, right. I think that's what you're saying. I don't think we're going to need the extra time, but yeah. if we do, we will. Yeah, we can, we can approve the permits uh, and also... There's, uh, there's other methods as well that don't require a meeting to approve outdoor seating that would go to the ward councilor and the uh, city council president. So I, I think we're going to get this done. I don't think there'll be an issue with that. Great. And I, I know, uh, Kristen, you live down in the Assembly Row area, and there were many of the restaurants in attendance uh, from the Assembly Row area. So I'm, I'm sure you're going to get as many phone calls as I do or Matt does about what's happening. When can we do this? Matt, let's go, uh, let's go back over to one thing very quickly that we talked about the last time you were on, and that is the city budget. When do we anticipate? What are the dates that you've got? Um, I know there was a great discussion um, last week uh, with uh, certain city staff about when they could deliver the budget to you for review. Yeah, so status still remains the same. Uh, we're hoping to get an update on the budget this week. There was a finance meeting last night as well. Um, so we have not received the budget yet. Uh, we're expecting it, but we really, I, and I w understand in total appreciation for the fact that city staff are struggling to get this done in a timely manner. I understand that completely. Uh, but the finance committee and the city council is gonna take their time with it as well. Uh, and just make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep as many employees as possible uh, while also maintaining a uh, manageable budget. So I don't have an update on that. I hope next week we will have an update on the budget, uh, but usually around this time is when we begin the budget process and we finish late June. So we're looking at a mid-June beginning and I don't know whether we're gonna go over into July, but we're gonna, we're gonna do what's necessary to have a transparent budget process. Well, I think patience is going to be the uh, patience is going to be the letter, the word that I spell out on my refrigerator going forward for the next four to five months. Let me shift, if you will allow, both of you, if you'll allow me, the events over the weekends in reaction to the, I'll use my word, into the murder of George Floyd, um, was on the top of the agenda for everyone since um, the incident happened. Unfortunately, it spilled over from very, very peaceful protests by thousands of people, possibly hundreds of thousands of people across this country. It spilled into a storyline of one of um, looting and violence and the questioning of where, where the leadership is in this country. I want to try to if you could kind of give a synopsis of what your thoughts were about the incidents over the weekend. Kristen, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. You want me to start? Yes. Yep. I think we have to. Uh, I, I'm disheartened and disgusted. We're still having this argument and that there isn't more change. The very fact that 
George Floyd had to die, or that to be to be a, to be a, a resident of color running in your neighborhood and getting shot, or it's just we have so much work to do, and I'm committed to making a better world, and I. I, I'm, I'm frustrated because I don't just want social media posts. I want, I want us to do positive action for change. And I want to hear as many voices as I can to, to just make this change happen in our country. And I see this as very much a local and state issue because federal leadership um, and the occupant in the White House has proven they're not interested. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult conversation and some of the most difficult conversations are the ones that absolutely need to be had. And they need to be had today, not tomorrow, not after a commission studies things, not after government officials get their act together. And if they don't lead, then my opinion is we will. The private residents of uh, citizens or residents or businesses, we will. And I, I can't say it enough. I, I try to keep my political opinions to myself when I'm interviewing people, but we have a total and complete void at the top, the very top of leadership ranks in this country. I am appalled, appalled at the behavior of the leaders of this country right now. Matt, I wanna turn it over to you. You and I share something in common. And it's beyond being Somerville kids. It's beyond um, being officials in the city. It's beyond being political animals. It's beyond having the same beliefs when it comes to basic human rights. And that's being members of the United States military. I want to ask you a question. Do you think that we are the military of this country being utilized the way we should be used when we're called in to break up protests? Wow, Joe. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I think... <laughs> First of all, let me say I would have loved for the National Guard to be involved during the pandemic uh, when people were in desperate need of help. Uh, and I see this is kind of a trend uh, that you see with Republicans, um, not to get to completely political, but um, they don't seem to think that it's the federal government's responsibility to help people. They just see it's the federal, but they see somehow it's the federal government's responsibility uh, to crush people, uh, which is the words that the president's using is put these people down uh, sort of attitude. And they were not there when people needed ventilators, when there was a uh, real disorder in the streets and people were concerned about what was happening. Uh, same thing with Katrina as well. People think that, you know, Trump is just some new thing, but Bush did the same thing. Uh, they had, there was no National Guard assistance for people desperately in need of help until there was looting. And then the National Guard got sent in to put down the looting. Uh, so all this is to say, you know, there is a role for the National Guard and military uh, if there's riots and things like this. So I don't want to say that they're not needed in that capacity, but it would have been nice to have them when people, were, when people are still sick and dying. And, you know, the, the military is there to help people, not just to kill people or to fight or go to war. Uh, they're there for our protection, and I don't see them being used in that capacity. So it takes some rethinking. Matt, you know, I wanted to give you the few extra minute there, um, and I appreciate both of you being honest and weighing in on that issue. I'm sorry, we're out of time. You're both back, invited anytime you want. Um, for Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. Thanks to City Council President Matt McLaughlin and City Councilor at Large Kristen Strezzo. Until next time, please stay safe, stay informed.